So welcome and welcome, Pam. Good to see you. <laughs> um, we're very happy to see so many of you in here after the bus trip and everything. Um, this is the safety working group, and we'll be presenting hopefully some exciting data that you agree with this good film, right? Uh, I'm Robin Christensen. I'm among the co-chairs. Oh, I forgot the switcher. Do we have a switcher? That's equally important. Okay. So some housekeeping rules, mostly for the virtual part, but I'm not sure we have a virtual component yet. Uh, do we have a vir do we have the virtual? We don't. No. So that's the tricky. Do you think there are some? Okay, I'll 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 stick to my routine then. Uh, the idea is that those who are with us virtually, they should mute their microphones, and then any comments and questions should be, um, if possible, delivered in the chat, and then Marie here will be holding on to them and ask them in person to us. Okay, so um, okay, so that would be the housekeeping rule on the virtual part, and all of you just raise your hand, especially when we say now we would like some questions and comments because that's part. That's critical to OMRAC principles. So Lee, maybe you can tell us why we're here, the one-liner in terms of stand-up comedy. Hi, how are you? Lee Simon, uh, co-chair. Uh, and as everyone knows, uh, this safety SIG has been going on at OMRAC for at least maybe the entire time I've been involved in OMRAC. So sometime in the 90s. Uh, and the reality is, is that this is an incredibly controversial issue. But until now, the safety information was never actually adjudicated by patients. We never had patient input into this whole business of safety. And you know, the safety issues are complex. And what is safety? What is an adverse event? What needs to be reported? What needs to be considered? And now that we've had patient input, we have an entirely new way to actually look at the safety outcomes. What is important to patients? And you know, there is probably no topic more important in clinical trial design than what and how a patient deals with a safety issue. So that is what it, we're trying to do. So it changes the tenor, I believe, uh, of the entire debate. And for the first time, we're really beginning to be all inclusive of what actually goes on in clinical trials. So that's what we're here to do. So I think we are ready to get started with that important opener. Um, I'll happy to give the floor to Niti and Vibeke, who will introduce to us what I would call in a, in a, in a kind of like paragraph heading, the current standard, how our trials run today, i.e. some cohorts, I guess, the better ones, the rigorous ones. So what's the current standard, both from the clinical and from the patient perspective? Medium again, please. Thank you, Robin. Um, so, oh, thank you. Uh, you did, yeah, all thanks to Torte's special talents there. So, um, in general, as, as Lee alluded to, and also just a quick reminder if you haven't signed in on the sign in sheet, please make sure that you do and you can pass it around again. Um, but in a trial, Healthcare professionals typically ask a non-specific question and non-specific, so it's not leading. You're not already planting an idea of an adverse event potentially in the patient's head, which there are pros and cons to each approach, but typically it's a non-specific question, and such as the one you see here. Have you experienced any new symptoms since your last visit, last assessment? Um, they're collected, but they're interpreted through the lens of the investigator. So the patient can tell you what they think is happening, but the investigator is the one who puts their final spin on it. Um, they assess the severity, the frequency, as well as the relationship to a treatment. So, I mean, we've heard in multiple sessions, attribution can be a problem, but they still try to attribute. There is a lot of literature to support that they do a really lousy job of attribution. Um, they may or may not ask the participant their opinion on these aspects, either to get clarifying information or what they think is really going on or to try to better um, determine what's going on. And then they also may report things which are a little bit outside of the realm of what the patient is feeling in terms of laboratory changes that may or may not be associated with the symptoms that are reporting and then ultimately derive a diagnosis from it. Um, and then there is a dictionary that exists 
to standardize the terms that are used to describe these events known. There, there was one way long ago, um, and then MEDRA has been the current gold standard for that. And it does get revised and updated on a regular basis. Um, so after these adverse events have been reported for any clinical trial setting, if it's a therapeutic product going before regulatory approval, the regulators review those data um, and they make their own assessments along with whatever the sponsor might have stated related to the risks and benefits of that particular therapy. For the approved therapy, um, some of these risks and benefits, um, not all are typically presented in the product labeling, but then there may also be additional details that don't make it into the publication, but are available in documents online at the FDA website or the European website, um, depending on if the drugs are approved. If they're not approved, a lot of this information doesn't make it into the public domain other than in publication. And then methods do exist to report such information post approval. They are not great. Um, less than 10% of adverse events post approval get reported. Um, however, these, in this case, they can still be reported directly by patients, but then are still typically interpreted through the lens of the sponsor. Um, the one good thing in all of this is the FDA has made a big push towards what's considered or what they've termed patient focused drug development where it is really to, and there's many more things that come in under patient drug development, but I, but I highlighted those things that are relevant in terms of safety, where they want to um, get more information around patient preferences related to the uh, acceptability of trade-offs and treatment benefits and risks, and identifying the information, again, that is most important to patients in terms of treatment benefits and risks. So, that all said, there is a, uh, a tool out there that exists, again, that Lee alluded to a little bit, that's called ProCPCAE, which is a cancer tool um, where patients can report adverse events related to their cancer and or their treatments in clinical trials of oncology therapies. The problem there, again, is that although there are many items, those items um, can be winnowed down by the sponsor or the investigators to ask only those that they deem pertinent to patients. There was no patient developed, um, enough patient input. There was some, but not a lot of patient input. That's clear in CPCA, pro CPCAE. And um, they don't actually ask patients to necessarily report or help um, clarify which AEs they want to be asked about. So it's still driven primarily by the investigators and the sponsors, which of all the event terms will be asked. Just a couple of things to kind of add. First of all, um, the sponsors, particularly when they're up to phase three, will have a list of preferred terms, suggested terms to use for adverse events that are commonly reported with that product. And that of course makes it easier for them to catalog them and that makes it much easier for labeling purposes and so on. So they are suggested terminology that, that the investigators are asked to try to use if at all possible. So that changes already what the patients may be reporting. The PRO CTCAE is like the CTCAE we have done for a toxicity index. And of course we changed it because many of the lab tests that are considered to be moderate in a cancer patient that would be considered relatively severe in our population. And for that reason too, the PRO CTCAE is not very relevant to what we would think that our patients would be concerned about. And so what we've been working on is asking them not just about adverse events, but what are their harms that they fear and what are the aspirations that they have for a new therapy? And how can we maybe accommodate those in what we want to develop as a PRO, a CTCAE? So as we go forward this afternoon, keep your mind open to the idea that we're looking at not just, not just specific safety adverse events, but we're kind of looking at how the patients view 
their way of assessing a, a new medication or a new therapy in the context of both them and their disease experience. Thank you. Yeah, I can in that vein. That oh, was, you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, 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 what are our plans for the future? Yeah, yeah. So, well, I did want to say, I mean, we are, we are going to speak to the plans for the future, but to get more, although, you know, I'm a patient research partner in the industry and a researcher, we're going to hear from the patient research partners um, in the working group related to their thoughts about um, adverse event collection as well. So introducing Pam and Marika. Yeah, it works. Thank you. What do you have to say? Yeah, you want me to stand up? Yes, uh, I don't like to stand up. But we get them later. So, uh, so Marika and I are going to be giving a short uh, perspective on how we feel as patients and also a little bit about other input. We can skip this one. Everybody knows us. This is Pam. This is Marika. She's from England. I'm from the Netherlands. We both PRPs and involved in many projects. We're very happy to be here and we're more happy that you are here. So that's a good, big, good start, I think. Um, I'd like to present this one, and you will see this in, in more meetings, I think. This is the participation letter. And um, in this project, in the safety project, patients are really involved from the beginning by identifying domains that are important for safety. And, um, and the group has continued for many, many years with patients from the start as well. So I think this is a good example how you can involve patients in your projects. Um, I don't, if, you, if you need more information about this letter, please drop by after the session, okay? For patients, what's important in medication treatment is of course the, effic the efficacy of the medication that you're taking. But unfortunately, uh, side effects are happening a lot. And what the patient is doing, I'm talking for myself, but I know from other patients that's, uh, that's the same thing, is that you're always balancing benefits and risks. So your efficacy is most important, but are you willing to, to take those benefits of those uh, side effects that comes along with it? Just to make it easy, I copied a slide from the International Classification of Functioning, because here you see many domains. It has, an, it has another meaning, but you see that many domains also are important when we talk about side effects. So it's a combination that we make. It's the health condition, but if we, instead of the health condition, think of medication. It affects your participation. It affects your activities. It affects your body functions and structures. It affects everything, and most important are the personal factors as well. And side effects can have an impact on life quality. And uh, we've seen in the presentation of NITI that it's important as well. For patients, it's, it's important the severity. What is the severity of the side effect? How does it impact my quality of life? Because it can limit all the things that I do, my life, my family, my, my role, everything. The frequency is also important because how often does the side effect occur? If the side effect is only small, and it occurs once a week and it has huge efficacy, I'm willing to take the side effect. But in order to decide it, it's also necessary to measure it. And it also counts for duration. How long does it last? And the last thing we added, it should get more attention in publication trials and clinical practice as well, because we talk all, almost all the time about efficacy, but side effects for patients are underestimated. So it needs more attention, I think, because it can also and in adherent behavior resulting in negative uh, treatment results. Non-adherent behavior, I have to say. This is a mistake <laughs> slide, sorry. So there are benefits, sorry, there are benefits and harms, as we know, to medications. Medications for me have reduced my pain, have improved my mobility, certainly from when I was first diagnosed, although as time goes on, my mobility gets worse. Um, but they also importantly put, prevent or postpone rapid joint damage in RA and damage in other place in, in other uh, health conditions. And overall, they improve quality of life. But they do have damaging side effects too. Some of those damaging side effects will be short term, and some are are long term. For example, I uh, developed quite severe liver damage from one of the biologics. But thankfully, over time, that improved. 
Uh, some other side effects from my medications have not improved. Um, I've been left with permanent gastric problems from NSAIDs, etc. So there is no opportunity, as far as I'm, I'm aware, for patients to, to register the distressing side effects. There's obviously the biologics register, but there are side effects I find really distressing and I can't report them. And to the clinicians, they're not really that much of a problem, but to me, they're a big problem. So what do we need? Um, in the future, this is a plea for a way to tweak really good medications such as glucocorticoids so that the side effects aren't as bad. I mean, they've been out for what, 75, 80 years. Please find some way of making that excellent drug less of a side effect, less, less burdensome. Um, and I'm really chuffed that uh, daughter has started this work because there is great need for an act of measure, which represents the domains which are important to patients. And daughter actually has done a great job of including us as patients. So thank you. Dick. So I guess it's fair to say, and thank you, Pam and Midi, uh, sorry, and, and Mariki. So I think it's fair to say that uh, now we, without further ado, we should introduce the queen, sorry, the fellow daughter. Will you please come up here and tell us about our objectives and the results we've achieved so far? And I've, I'm fair to say, following the pun previously with the queen, please, will you rock, <laughs> will you rock us? Thank you, Robin. Now, first of all, let me tell you about the objectives for the work we're doing in the safety working group. As you have just heard from Pam and Marigi, the patient perspective in drug safety reporting is lacking. And that's why the safety working group aims to develop a patient reported outcome measure for patient reported harms. And what we are currently doing is that we are developing a list of important patient reported outcome domains for harms in rheumatic and musculoskeletal conditions. And today we hope that we will get support for a preliminary list of safety domains that could be included in the Delphi. Now, let me tell you about our recent study uh, and let me show the preliminary results that we have from this study. As you probably know from our preparatory video, we have already conducted several studies. We have talked to patients about their concerns for DMARTs, we have also conducted a scoping review, searching for patient-reported outcome domains from existing outcome measures, but we didn't find any appropriate ones. We then conducted a, a systematic review where we extracted harms that could be reported by patients. And results of this study, we merged with two other OMAREC studies. And in that way, we ended up having a list of 135 symptomatic side effects within 12 domains. And the, that provides background for our recent study, where we conducted seven focus groups and 10 individual interviews. The aim of the focus groups was to explore what patients considered important to know about side effects. And the aim of the individual interviews was to find out whether of any of the candidate side effects were relevant to patients and how patients comprehend and classified these side effects. Overall, 34 uh, participants uh, participated in, uh, in our discussions. Nine were from Australia, 14 were from Europe, and 11 were from North America. Patients were 58 eight, eight years in, in mean, uh, and two out of three were female. Almost everybody were white, and nearly 60% had, had RA, while just over 20% had PSA and AXP, respectively. The most commonly used rheumatic drug was biological DMARTs followed by conventional DMARTs. These are the 12 overall themes that we presented to patients. Each theme consists of several sub-themes, and within each sub-themes, there were several items of specific side effects included. After ending our uh, interviews with patients, we had discussed 171 uh, items of specific side effects with patients. 
But let me show you an example of how we have worked with these themes. If you look at the first sub, the first theme, this, this can be divided into three sub themes, reflecting bladder, genitals, or reproductive organs, and hormones. Other themes will reflect just one sub themes, while others again will reflect several sub themes. And in that way, we have divided all of our overall themes into relevant sub themes. But let's stick to the first theme. These are the items of specific side effects included in this theme. Patients gave us input on the themes, sub themes, and items of specific side effects. In this case, we had used the term genitals uh, prior to interviews, but some patients said that reproductive organs might be a better word. Other ones disagreed and would keep genitals. Hormones was also a point of discussion. As some patients said, when you mention hormones, we are more thinking about emotions. And therefore, they suggested to leave this sub themes this, this sub-theme out. They also gave input to the specific side effects. And they adjusted some of the side effects, and they suggested new side effects that we added to our list. Let me show you another example of what patients said to us. This theme consists of four th sub-themes, and these are the specific side effects included under each sub-theme. In this case, we had used the term chest prior to interviews, but some patients said that heart might be a better word. Breathing seems to be commonly understood by everybody, but excess bleeding was not clear to patients, and therefore they suggested blood circulation or circulatory system instead. Swelling was also a discussion point. As patients said, when you mention swelling, we are more thinking about joint swelling, and that's in another, uh, in another theme, and therefore they suggested terms like uh, lymph system or lymph instead. They also adjusted some of the specific side effects, and they suggested two new side effects that we added to the list. I hope these examples give you an idea of how patients work with us all through uh, all of the themes. Results showed that in particular, three themes seem to be overlapping. So let's have a look at those three themes. First, these are the side effects within brain and nerves. And when discussing this theme, some patients said, I wonder where sleep is, because I see this is more related to brain. Other patients said, is fatigue somewhere else? And because they saw the specific items uh, within brain could be, could be related to, uh, to fatigue. When discussing sleep, patients said that fatigue was fine, but it might fit better on the brain. On the other hand, other patients said that they felt that sleepiness were overlapping to fatigue, tiredness, or lack of energy, and therefore it might fit better into sleep. Now, let's add the theme of mood and emotion, which was the term we used prior to interviews. Other suggestions from patients were mood, emotions, and behavior. Simply just emotions or emotional response. One item was clearly mood, and one item was clearly emotion. However, eight other items could be related either to emotion or to mood. One of the side effects suggested by patients was excessive thoughts, but this one was discussed whether it would belong better on the sleep, or on the brain, or nerves. On the other hand, other patients said that they would consider excessive thought to be overlapping to over-optimistic feelings, manic or full of ideas. Another example is when discussing brain and nerves. Here patients said that some of them, that some of them would consider paranoia to belong more to mood and emotions. But again, other one disagreed and would keep it under brain. It was also said that sensing things that are not real might be overlapping to paranoia, and some patients suggested to collapse those two. An example of an item that was not clear to patients 
was low, loss of identity. Patients said that if loss of identity means that you totally forget who you are, then it fits perfectly fine on the brain. But it's more like a feeling like forgetting who you are, losing your identity, it might fit better on the mood and emotions. So I hope this, these examples uh, leads to that you can see that there might be several overlaps between those three themes. Therefore, it might be beneficial to collapse them into one. And in that case, these will be the 10 overall themes that might be relevant for patients' own reports. In the focus groups, patients explained to us what they felt was important to know about such potential side effects. They said that it was important for them to know about the impact on life. And that would be the, uh, their daily life, it would be their work life, it would be family life, and it would be their social life. They also said it's important for us to know about the frequency, the duration, and the severity of the specific side effects. And there might be an overlap between severity and impact on life. They also said that the physical function and the mental function was important aspects. And so was the economic and time energy consuming aspects. They also said it was important to know about the risk for drug failure. And it was also important to know about the long-term effect as well as the impact on other diseases and other drugs. And several contextual factors was also mentioned in that connection. Patients also emphasize that the balance between benefit and harm was very essential to them. It was also discussed how the cumulative burden of having more than two side effects or two or more than two side effects at the same time could be measured. However, there was no clear answer to that. All of these aspects can relate to the four careers of pathophysiological manifestations, life impact, death, social and resource use. And our question to you is now, based on all of the input that we have from patients, are we ready to move in to the Delta? Thank you, Dori. It appears that you really rocked them there. Um, I think it's time now that we have had some lectures or whatever, with the word is at Omarag, I think the time is for some Q&A and I'll do my best to facilitate and give some smarter people the microphone when the answers comes up. So um, please raise your hand, comments. Do you need a safety tool at your clinic, um, Randall? Uh, thanks. So, uh, I, people know me, I tend to look at the end and see what we need to do. So from the standpoint of reporting and recording patient adverse events, how, are, how do we see this being incorporated into clinical trials? Because you're gonna have Medra dictionary, it's there, it's gonna stay. So how do we collect the patient related adverse events? And when you're collecting the patient adverse events, that means that patients are going to have to do more work to input that data, right? Mm -hmm. So I always worry about patient burden yep. in clinical trials. And so that's when I'm looking at the end result. How does this get put together so that it's not, it's used and it is useful for the patient, but it doesn't burden them to the extent that they just say, I've had enough because they already talked to the investigator. It's a lovely question, and uh, I can only speculate and, and tell you what our goals are, and then I'll also give the microphone to Lee, so heads up. Uh, what I hope that we'll get out of this is a complementary way of co collecting data, i.e. the patient voice. And we are very keen on kind of like uh, succeeding, like they did in cancer. We heard about the PRO CCCAE as a successful uh, journey they have had in, that, uh, in those conditions. Uh, I, I consider it, I know that you worry about the burden to the patients sitting there fitting in all these questionnaires, 
But I'm happy to say, remember today, it's only about the domains, which always sounds like a shortcut at these meetings. But, but, but the measurement part could be a computer, computer adaptive testing. We have many smart people who can help us on that. Um, so I, I consider it, but my personal imagination is, is that someday after doing lots of fancy psychometrics, we'll be able to come up with scores likely by some domains with the if, if it's not unidimensional some would argue that we cannot come up with one safety score so so that's that's just a long list of goals but i do think that patients are would be happy to invest more times but i think that patients should speak to that uh, whether we can add more uh, burden so to speak to trials in the future so lee what do you think that your friends in fda and ema would like well, this is really congruent with this whole movement of uh, patient input, patient facilitating information. Uh, there's always been this great uh, tension between the spontaneous reporting and querying, and do you ever query versus just let them report. I think that I could imagine moving into the world where a pro CTCAE might be actually merged into this kind of thing. And I cannot imagine there aren't replicate items that are gonna end up in there. And it may end up being far fewer things they have to go through. Unfortunately, Randall and for other people in the room, it is gonna be multi steps to get to that point. And we're, all we're doing is getting prepared for a Delphi. The Delphi will either alter the actual format uh, based on what people think, where we can begin to cancel and get smaller bits of data. And I think that um, one of the key issues has been uh, the, the fear that you have actually brought up. And I think that in fact, as we accrue more information, the fear may become unfounded uh, because it would be so well and easy to combine them. Uh, some of you may or may not remember a gazillion years ago, when a member of UMARAC came out with like a, Martin, you probably have to help me with this. It was like 129 pages of safety data that was reported to us that maybe could be a safety data set that we would use for UMARAC. And, uh, you know, that, that's not doable. It, that's not going to happen. And on the other hand, we actually do somehow get a handle on what is happening here. And so I'm not that worried. We'll see. We'll see. And I think both EMA and FDA will be happy with this if we actually can make it worth what workable. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited about this uh, because it's putting the, uh, you know, the, the weight of what patients think important yeah. in these domains. And, and you may have difficulty, you know, classifying the, the domains compared to the organ-based classification of, of, of trial-based uh, uh, registration of side effects. But I don't think that is really, you know, uh, uh, of, of essential importance that those domains differ because in the end, what we get here is, you know, this is what we experience a lot and so pay attention to that. So I think that's really, really important. But I would like to write, raise one little thing which was in the end of your presentation. I have had only a few really aha moments in my life where I thought, now I really get it. And one of those was in one of one prior OMRAC meeting where we had a pre-meeting on safety. I can't remember when that was. It wasn't yeah. too long ago, but longer than I think. Huh? Terrible. Terrible. And there, I suddenly it landed to me that there is a concept here, and I'm going to argue against my own feelings about HRQL. So you'll like what I'm going to say if you what we need, we need these domains, you know, fine. We need to focus on what's really important, measure all that. What is not being measured today is something that is not a side effect, but it is the overall burden of treatment. Yeah. So if you ask a patient and you ask, so, so how, does it, how is that for you taking methotrexate? I'm not asking whether you're nauseated or fatigued or whatever. How is it to be taking methotrexate every week? And about half of them will say, well, you know, one, 1 1.5 of my weekdays every week is totally lost. I can't do anything. I'm 
you know, conked out. Uh, I don't, I'm not productive, but I take it because the rest of the days are so good and so much better than what I had. That is not picked in any of these questionnaires because like you say, there's no place to put that because it's non-specific. But if you ask at least if there's going to be a global domain that catches that. And for me, that also includes the burden of going to the clinic, getting your transportation right. arranged, waiting in the waiting room, uh, doctors not there, rescheduling, uh, having to think about taking your pills or your shots every day or every week. Uh, that whole thing right. that starts when you start taking treatment. I think that element, I would love to see that entered as a separate domain on top of all the other things which are more specific. But I would argue that, that we've actually included a lot of that when we're thinking about the way Dorothy put it together because they include the fears, the fears of what might happen as well as the hopes, the aspirations. I know, but th those are all so, specific questions. I want to ask a sure non-specific question. Well, I'm not say. sure that they are so specific, Martin, because oh? I think when we ask patients to put it in the context of how they they are feeling, then we get to those impacts. And so it may be that the way Dorte was putting together these domains was a helpful way of allowing those fears, those aspirations, and those sort of unwritten comments and impacts are now then taken into account. Working off Martin's patient's global impression of burden, patient's global impression of burden, because you could say, right. And so that can be none to horrendous, right? Or, right? Because that, you know, when we took a patient global impression of change, it's a really nice global assessment of how the patient feels in their particular areas of interest for their disease. But I think patient global impression of burden would actually be very useful as a single measure to get a gestalt. So I just wanted, to, sorry, I just wanted to add because we also need to have the patient's explicit input to whether they will be too burdensome to do it. And please, let's try to keep the focus on, according to our, all our principles, we always start with subdomains, items, whatever, because I think you're getting ahead of ourselves by saying, let's celebrate one score. <laughs> I, I think it's too early, uh, but we, a domain, but that domain could turn into a measurement. I promised Lynn the microphone many minutes ago. Well, I will I'll pick up on that discussion as well, because I think it's quite important. And I agree, it's just one single domain. You still capture all the other things. And it's particularly going to be particularly important in tapering trials. because what, And we're about to start one, so we could test it, if you like. Because one of the things when you're suggesting to a patient in remission that they might start reducing their medication, and I'd love to have feedback from the patients, is you say, well, you know, we're going to reduce your overall burden. Uh, uh, but there's always this underlying fear that the disease will flare and all of that. But this would be a great measure to capture that. But do we actually reduce the overall fear and global, the burden of uh, everything related to medication? You would hope it might, but you don't know until you measure it. Uh, but the, the reason I put my hand up in the beginning was um, how many items are going to be potentially going into the Delphi? 30 or I mean, what I haven't seen in Delphi so far um, is, you know, rating it, but also asking the people answering the Delphi to do a bit of that binning and winnowing that um, being uh, sort of presented so eloquently. So that as we're going through, can, can you see where you might be responding at another, where, where can you see the overlap? We don't routinely do that, do we? But it could be an opportunity. Yeah. So to get to hear from patients, because I think that is very important, actually, Pam, then Marika, then Deb. Yeah, I think, you know, as, as Martin has said, 
the domain that what, what, what's been presented so far is great but i do agree that something about the, the about the overall burden a lot of my side effects were never taken into account because they were just side effects but they impacted me hugely and methotrexate classic example but lots of other examples i'll just give you one um on uh cyclosporin not only put on weight i grew hair everywhere i had hair sticking out of my fingers every every week i'd go and get my hair waxed from my fingers i was in my early 30s can you imagine what it was like for a woman to have hair literally everywhere the overall burden it was nasty You want, me to go, you want me to go next? Okay. Um, Deb Conson, PRP. Um, I'm from Wisconsin um, and first time being here and I love this conversation. So I wholeheartedly agree with him um, as far as adding the burden to it because methotrexate, it's not only the medication and the issues that come with methotrexate, but there's the blood work too. And how carefully, carefully is that followed up on? I immediately put it into my phone because I'm like very organized that way. But who does that too? And how often is the blood work truly followed, followed up with? And until the doctor will say, so did you get your blood work done at your follow-up appointment? It's like, oh, I forgot about that. Um, so, and for somebody who is no longer driving or disabled completely, that's another trip to the clinic too. Yeah, just um, for the discussion, I'm not agreeing. <laughs> oh, well, that's the one. Because I think um, uh, this specified everything. I think if we talk about total burden, it's like accumulation, accumulation of side effects. So if you can separate those side effects and talk about it and handle those, according to the terrific uh, work that Dorte has uh, undertaken so far, I think that's that's might be sufficient and i think the total burden that we are referring here might also have a psychological component because you are dependable of the medication and that's what patients will understand i think if you talk about total yeah when you talk about total burden no it's not a disadvantage but i'm not sure whether you cannot capture it in all the side effects that have been mentioned here because we have a lot of psychological effects as well side effects mentioned in this sheet No, but I'm just thinking, I like, I like new ideas, but I'm just thinking, what do you want to measure? What, as a patient, if somebody's asking me, how do you feel about the total burden of your medication strategy? To be honest, when I had arthritis with Hans Roske 35 years ago, first diagnosis, I refused medication for three full years. It cost me two joints, but I was not willing to take anything because I hated it. And you know what he said to convince me to take it? And that's, I think, the total burden. He said, Marie, if you're not taking the medication, you will die of your illness and not of the medication. And that was the, that was the thing that convinced me to try to take the medication. And then, of course, you have the metatrexate, you have all the side effects that you can encounter. But if you treat those side effects one by one, but then as a patient, you need to know what side effects it is, how you can, how can, how you can talk about it. But I think it's a different area. I think it's a different topic then. What is not side effect? Sorry, just. Yeah, I, um, I'm a little bit confused by the terminology also of total burden, because you have total burden of disease. But what we're actually discussing, and I, I feel that there is a, a, a difference between to, total burden of side effects. That's the safety part. We are in the safety work group. The burden of treatment or um, is about the way of application. How often do you have to go to the hospital? Is it daily? I, do you know, need to take something on a daily basis? So that's the, the way of administration, which has nothing to do with the, with the side effects, which has nothing to do with safety, but it's just the burden of treatment. So I think we need to make the distinction between burden of treatment, and specifically, I know also from the early days when I had psoriasis, and I, I see it also in my children, it has a huge burden uh, to start with creams and ointments. And if you want to get children, and my children want to have children, they, they also 
do not take some of them medications. So they experience really the burden of the treatments that they have to take and not, not get the side effect. But that I think we need to, because that's also relevant if we go to instruments, because they have to match and measure different constructs. Two quick examples of burden, as Martin said, uh, the, for example, both Martins. Um, go, when I was working, I would often have to get blood tests. When I'm working away, I'm working hundreds of miles away. Trying to get a blood test every week or every two weeks or every three weeks was a nightmare. Also I mentioned about all of the hair. I would spend a fortune. So that was a burden. It was a financial burden that, you know, spend a fortune on getting hair removed. So they're, they're kind of burdens that are extra to the disease burden and the side effects. So one quick comment I had, based on what you know right now and what you've heard, we're going to have more discussion, but I did wanna just check with the PRPs because the question was raised about patient burden. Would you, I mean, we, of course, from the focus group, but would you be willing to complete such a tool if you were in a clinical trial of a therapeutic? Like if we, well, we don't have one yet, right? But if you had something where you could feel like you could voice your adverse events, do you feel that that's important? And that, you know, regardless of whatever the burden was to fill out whatever the resulting questionnaire or the measurement tool was for it, that you would want to fill that out? Okay, so, so number one, I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity. Uh, and I think two, two aspects. I don't think, think that we need to grapple with how to measure it because with computer adaptive testing, you can reduce the burden of completing such a tool, first of all. The second, uh, uh, second thing is, um, I think we are missing an opportunity to give a patient perspective. So sometimes when you're in clinical trials as a researcher, you are asked to rate the severity of an adverse event, right? And actually you get, one, two, three, four, five, you rate. And it's actually pretty marginal what number you put on. And there's no sort of benchmark of what you put on. It, it, it is the place where the patient should be filling in because it's both affecting them. And so I, I'm really excited for the opportunity for you to rate how bad that adverse event is. Just like as Pam said to you, because we may underpay what your experience is. And for the regulators, what they always talk about is when they approve a drug is benefit, versus risk. And I guess one of the evaluation we would like to get our patient is when you rate that severity of the side effect, whether you're willing to continue with the treatment, that's the benefit, or you want to stop because the side effect is too much. And that perspective is not something that a healthcare professional can give. Only the patient can do that. And, uh, and as the last thing, just a suggestion is that I didn't know that you want to put all the symptoms into a, a domain. You just have a symptom, right? So you can recategorize all your symptom in by your metro uh, category. You can give a free form and reclassify that because what is really important is for us to know how bad the symptom is from your perspective. I think that that is, that is I, you know, if you think about what we have with the immune related checkpoint inhibitor sick group, we have exactly the opposite thing. We're dealing with the side effect generated by another treatment. And the patient always said this thing, I need my side effect treated because I want to continue my checkpoint inhibitor treatment. So that is a patient option. And that is really where we really need the patient's evaluation of that. I don't think uh, personally, I don't think we are the right person to make that judgment. Into the question about how I would feel about having to fill out another questionnaire. I think the, the crucial element is how that is explained to me. So it didn't even to start a medication, the decision to start a medication 
is based on the information that you receive about both the effectiveness and the side effects. So if you don't, if there isn't adequate information, accurate and comprehensive information about the side effects, then you're actually doing a disservice by not collecting that information from patients in the first place. So to not collect it is a bigger issue than to ask the patient to collect it. And if that's explained to a patient that, look, this is how you can be helping. Most patients are going to be uh, thinking not only of themselves, but how can I help other people who are dealing with the same issues? If it is explained, framed that, this will give more accuracy to start the, for in the initial discussion about starting or choosing between medications. I think you're going to find most patients are pretty altruistic about it and will dig deep and fill out however many questionnaires are required. And the only other comment I wanted to make, and I'm sorry I'm new to this, but what is the underlying assumption about the worry about collecting this information? Is the underlying assumption that it's not reliable information from the patient, that information from the clinician is more reliable. So I just put that out there, not for an answer, but just to put it out there. Just a quick response to that. I think that what, what experienced OMER actors would say to that is, if we don't do it a systematic approach, then it will be, I know the worst case scenario for many of us in the room would be the, the fame, infamous diary. Uh, if people were supposed to write how they feel and function on a, an, in a free text, that's not doable. We know that lots of pushback. So, so we are looking for the form, so we definitely trust the patient voice, but thanks to organizations like us, uh, we will be able to, to, to handle that process, how to make it a system that authorities will respect in the end. But we are, of course, not there yet, Randall. That's, but uh, it, Randall, it sounds like the patients I would be interested in investing some time, if it's, if it's, if, if, or some time extra. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Sort of all the questionnaires you're going to be doing SF36 and hacks and all the other things. And where do you put that at the top or at the bottom or in the middle of that? But uh, just from the standpoint of, I want to address the question of you're going to, you'll have enough of um, burden because you'll have the adverse events list. The problem is that the adverse event for one person is meaningless, while for another person, it's very meaningful. So burden is not just the adverse event, but it's perspective of how that adverse event affects that person. And that's why the burden changes is not specifically related to the adverse event, but it's perception of how that affects the patient. So I wanted to interject real quickly. One of the things that's been traditional about collecting adverse events is everything gets transferred into medical terminology, which is a foreign language to patients. Question. But she has just one thing. She asked a very specific question was, what are we worried about in the context of how many pages? And there is a belief system in measurement that if you ask patients to fill out 15,000 forms, they won't fill out 15,000 forms. So there's always been this effort to decrease the amount of paperwork. And you're correct. How do we know that? But this has been left over for De decades, and whether it's real or not remains unknown, now that we're in computers. So they said they want to fill it out. So, so you know people are interested in finding out. Now, that's, first I want to say, I think it depends on the topic, whether a patient is willing to fill out forms. And second, I think this, specifically this study, is perfect for computer-adapted testing. And then the burden will be lower. So I think then we have like, not everybody can use a computer and we have something else to solve, but at least the burden will be low. So um, the work that I've done with patients and researchers over many years is the bottom line that we come to when we're looking at what we want to ask in studies 
such as what we're talking about is that patients come up themselves with prioritizing what needs to be asked as far as what's important and what's nice to know. And researchers love nice to know because it comes, it gives them new information that they might be able to work with. But the nice to know, those are the things that patients get annoyed with having to fill out because they don't know why they're filling it out. It makes no sense to the trial that they're in or the study that they're in. It's not relevant to them. It just seems like something that they've got to do because the doctors asked them to do it. Now, in my opinion, this information is very important and no patient would even, would even think twice about filling this in because this is changing their lives. The burden, I think personally, is a bit of a nice to know and it, it, it's comes back to what was said before it's different to everybody like Pam the the examples that you were giving um are, are, are terrible but the alternatives weren't great either so it was a matter of choosing between what's great and what's not and some people will and some people won't and so the burden is going to be different for each individual and this information will give us the initial feedback that we need but if we want to talk about burden, I have a feeling that it might be more likely to come out in the um, uh, shared decision-making conversation potentially because the information needs to be discussed and, and then decisions need to be made. Sorry, Pam, I didn't yeah. mean to speak on your behalf. No, no, no. I agree with a lot of what you said. I think the difference for me was there were lots of other medications I could have been on that didn't have that burden. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I wasn't changed onto them because the clinician didn't think that burden was in, was relevant. Yeah, okay. It was dismissed, but for me it was huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it comes back to my point about conversations and 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 that sort of information is nice to know, but you know, that's more of a, a shared decision making and I think we should focus on the fact that this is about safety and patients are absolutely 100% interested in their own safety. And they're also interested in making sure that they're answering questions that are relevant to what they're dealing with at the time, not what's nice to know for everybody else. Thank you, Ben. I have an online, I have an online chat patient voice, which I would like to share with you. Personally, I like a list where I can use check marks, which do not take much time while I'm waiting for my doctor. It means I do not forget about areas. Thank you, Ina. Now, one, one thing I just wanted to add is this issue of burden came up as the happiness quotient <laughs> in the Terragal meeting. I don't know if you recall that, Lee, but you know there is a treatment satisfaction questionnaire. Yes, I know another questionnaire, but that does get at a level of treatment burden as well. I know the name is satisfaction, but it's also about like how, how willing are you to keep taking this medication because of X, Y, Z. So, I think there are tools that help us get at that. Um, but I, I do want us to bring it back that I, while I hear what's being said about burden, it's also just about how do we get the patient's opinion about adverse events? And are they willing? And I personally, you know, as a PRP, I agree with you, Allison, and with you, Ben, that I'm willing to fill out however long this questionnaire is because I also know my fear of adverse events even though I was a rheumatologist, even though I helped develop some of the drugs that I ended up taking, impacted my desire to take those drugs. So I, I think it is a very relevant question. And I'm also in the safety working group because I find it personally, but also broadly popular. Um, so David Liu, I'm from Melbourne, Australia. I'm, apart from being a rheumatologist, I'm also a clinical pharmacologist. I think this is really exciting. And I just, but I just wanted to say, that I think that the data science informatics methods are a lot closer than we think. Um, I mean, my group's already done work on natural language processing to try and improve um, spontaneous reporting of adverse events. But that kind of work is gonna get accelerated quickly through large language models. Now, when is that gonna to come to prime time in clinical trials? It's hard to say, but you can imagine that the domains that you've got here are no enormously useful for the kind of, um, for improving the algorithm, the training algorithm. So. Yeah, thank you to everyone for the work that they've done. So just to respond to the question about um, uh, what about the SF36? What about the hack? What about the EQ5B? You know, it's not just, I mean, it's so relevant what Ben raised 
uh, in terms of what's nice to know, but it's also what's relevant to the patient. And there are more questions on the hat now that are irrelevant, that are responsible for titrating my medications that aren't relevant. I'm a, vegetation, a vegetarian, I don't cut meat. Um, I have a car with a handle, a door handle that's completely, it's a push button. So it's not relevant. It's, um, I have, I, there's not a milk carton that I have to open. And yet I have, I'm forced to answer those to uh, have my medication titrated. And my daughter who also has RA, when she first developed RA, the angst over filling out these questions and being able to relate to the, what is not a relatable question. So when you see questions that are relatable about side effects and are pertinent versus questions that are a, a standard accepted tools that are a part of almost every study with the EQ5D doesn't mean anything to me, those categories. The, <laughs> So I would be willing to take it on, bottom line. Well, we, we are trying to talk about instruments still. We're still trying to be in domains. And we need to remember too, that domains overlap. They, they can't be carved individually differently along certain lines. So there are gonna be times and places where questions that we might be using will be overlapping, meeting. And then. So, so just very briefly, I mean, I, I accept all the criticisms of saying if you if you add burden, uh, and then burden is about going to the clinic, it, it adds noise to the assessment of safety. All that is true. If we focus on safety, the reason to ask a global question for me is also that many of the stuff patients experience are not events but they are continuous things that do not fit into those nice bins and, and reach the threshold where you say, doc, I you need to do something about this. Obviously, I mean, growing hairs all, all over your body is, that's an event and, and your doc not reacting to it is, is horrible. But I'm, I'm trying to address the accumulation of little things that you're not going to mention as an adverse event for example, because there's no time in the consultation to go in that there's all these other important things, but that you could sort of weigh in your head and say, you know, given everything, there's these all these little niggly naggly things adding up to something which is a burden, rather than having to put everything into bins. That's just my addition. I would say you're starting to talk about things related to measurement rather than domain. Well, but it sounds, yeah. Well, if it, if at least partly the, the discussion is about the usefulness uh, of a such tool from part of the regulator, I can say this is exactly where a reg the regulator is struggling to frame uh, the benefit risk. And these are the occasions where we at EMA, for example, we approach patient uh, um, organizations in, in writing because we are uh, we may struggle in, into framing what importance a specific side, side effect ha has. We know the drug has a side effect, but what, what, is, what is the value for this patient population? Um, and uh, well, this, this is a common, um, uh, therefore I, I'm, I, I think from the regulator side, we would be very happy to have such thing um, uh, when, when we get a drug application. Um, maybe maybe another comment. Uh, I would see a slight um, a danger here in underrating rare but severe side effects, because uh, we are looking. Well, probably the patient would, in the first instance, looking in what 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 is frequent and what is is pestering him or her. But um, something what is what is rare. Well, if the drug is kill, can potentially kill a patient might be underrated and this is, uh, this shouldn't happen. And then then afterwards and then down there. I think we have, I think we're gonna go to vote. Yeah, we're gonna try and do some wrapping up here. So let's make the comments brief. 
Sorry, really quickly, just on Martin's point, and I might be backing Martin up, which feels a little weird, but anyway, I'll, I'll do it. But a story from a, a friend of mine in Sydney um, who had uh, long-term RA. She had been on um, medications forever. They had only increased, you know, the old classic story where you're on two and then you're on four and then you're on six. And before you know, you're on 14 different medications. She went into a rheumatologist one day and said, I'm done. I have a feeling that all of these medications are actually just making me sick. I'm done. I'm not having them anymore. I am only here out of respect to you to let you know what's going on, but I'm not taking any of these anymore. I am done. And the rheumatologist, to her credit, said, um, you know, I understand what you're doing, but I don't agree. Um, can we stay in touch? And anyway, it went on for a couple of months and she did okay for a little while, but um, sure enough, ended up back and went back on some medications, but um, certainly not anywhere near what she was on before, but the burden became too much for her and she just reached the tipping point and put herself at great risk um, for her safety going off all of those medications, cold turkey, but um, yeah, credit to um, the team that she had around her and her own common sense that she came through it in the end, but it's a thing. For the safety context, I think there's a like dichotomous part that we need to look at, which is um, adverse events, which are resolved when you stop the medication and adverse events, which are permanent, such as with Plaquenil earlier on, um, if you're just looking at the bullseye target in the eye, you've already had light, you've increased risk of sight loss. So I think those are two things where it's really important to understand if the side effect goes away when you stop the medication or it's permanent. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah. on the app, you should be able to access the questionnaire within this. Um, within the SIG, if we can't, then we have a backup plan, but hopefully you can do it in the app. Well, yes. I'm just, I'm just, I'm not asking you to answer it yet. I want, <laughs> I just want to know that you can get to the poll. Well, you can answer it, but we want you to answer yes. <laughs> yes. And I just wanted to make sure people could get it in the app before we had to do the backup plan. But do you agree? And remember, we're asking about domains here, that there are enough qualitative data to move forward to the Delphi related to the domains for a patient reported tool related to adverse events. Yes, I agree. No, I don't agree. Don't know. I know I'm not supposed to sway your vote, but I'm gonna be shameless and a bad moderator and say, please vote yes. I think as a credit to all the work that George has done. And then um, also you should be able to answer free text. If you feel we are missing anything important, could you please give your ideas? Of course, we've taken notes from the discussion, but we also know that some people are quiet or have refining thoughts or what have you, sorry, George. Um, and if you could please provide those to us, we would very much appreciate it in moving the work forward. So I think that, you know, we've been going through this exercise for years, but I think this is the really the first time we have really <clears throat> dealt fundamentally with the issues that patients have raised and what those are and how they and how they get adjudicated is part now of the Delphi process and because we're in the world of computers and all that stuff that I can't stand uh, under those circumstances it allows us to consider different ways to collect the data um, I think that it probably will in least in musculoskeletal disease. I don't know if it'll do it elsewhere. Um, it probably, this is probably a nascent moment where that we will be going forward and changing the paradigm about how we collect safety data. We will probably have to, at some point, continue to do what we normally do. And then at some point, do an exploratory outcome that includes this kind of stuff 
in the clinical trials. And eventually, it, I would be very surprised if it's not adopted as a requirement if it actually works. And I think it does, it can be a very, it will increase the richness of that. Uh, for Martin, I think his obsession with this global issue is very important. But let's not forget, we do ask a question, I believe, that is a patient global responsiveness in actually a randomized controlled trial. In all ways, how are you feeling today? And that includes, it depends on how you ask the question, excuse me, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you about that question, okay? So in all ways, how are you feeling today is one way to do that. And you get baseline and you get then at the end of the trial or in the middle of the trial. And that kind of information tells you about burden. It tells you about drug effect. It tells you about benefit. It tells you about risk. In any case, I think this is a great discussion. I'd like to thank you all for actually participating. Look forward to the next rendition as we go through the Delphi process, because we'll inform you what happens in 2025. And you are hearing this first. We believe the next OMRAC will be in Europe in 2025. Don't ask me where, but in Europe. So we're making some progress here. So thank you very much for attending. And some of you who are interested in the vasculitis and um, shared decision-making, there was, they've changed the rooms. So if you haven't heard, the rooms are changed. And if you've not filled out your name, that'll be very important for us to maintain a list. So thank you, and we're adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.